I'm always the one who has to break up all of the good conversation that's going on. But uh, so sorry for doing that. But um, hopefully you're enjoying the day so far. Uh, my name's Rob Gibson. I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Business Development for Vital. And once again, welcome to the summit for this year. It's my pleasure to introduce our lunch speaker. Um, so I'll ask that as we go through the rest of the lunch, um, you kind of stay as quiet as you can and pay, pay attention to the lunch speaker. Your dessert is already on the table in front of you, so you don't have to get up for that. Uh, the last of the folks are coming through the buffet line as we talk. So, um, so I think we'll be ready to go here and give Dana, give Dana her time. So, so uh, Dana Lewis is the director of M Digital Life for W2O Group, working at the intersection of all things health and digital to help organizations understand, engage, and activate the online health ecosystem. Dana is, on, is well known in the healthcare social media space, first and foremost from founding and leading the HCSM Twitter chat community since 2009. Dana is also known as a leading e-patient, frequently speaking worldwide and publishing on topics related to patient engagement and the do-it-yourself and we are not waiting movements. Please join me in welcoming Dana. Thank you very much. How is audio in the back? Thumbs up? Good. And I apologize for those of you in the direct line of sight of this pillar. I'm sorry. I'm going to move around a little bit to try to make some eye contact with you, but feel free, of course, to get up and move. There's some seats on either side. I want to start by setting some context. Um, some of you may know of me or know of what I'm going to talk about. Some of you don't. But I always like to bring it back to why we care in healthcare and why this really matters. So I often tell people that getting diagnosed with a chronic disease is like being struck by lightning. You have no warning. You often can't prepare or prevent. You just have to deal with the fallout of what happens when you're struck by lightning. And I say this with certainty because I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the age of 14, three months into my freshman year of high school. And that anniversary sticks out in my mind. I remember the exact day, October 14, 2002. And every year that rolls around again, and it's actually next Friday, it's very top of mind for me, because it's been 14 years that I have had to be a pancreas in addition to being a human, an additional pancreas because mine's not working. And the reason diabetes is so hard, it seems really simple. Your pancreas no longer produces insulin. You need to inject it or use an insulin pump. It sounds very simple. But the reality is much, much harder than that. You see, modern insulin is good, but it takes 60 to 90 minutes to peak in your body, which means if you sat down right now and started eating and you gave yourself insulin, you are going to have a rise in your blood sugar. And for those of you with working pancreas, congratulations, you are pancreas and your body will just deal with it. But for me, if I sat down and ate, my blood sugar would begin spiking in 15 minutes after I ate and yet my insulin kicks in 60 to 90 minutes later. That's really hard to deal with, and it's always hard to know what's going to happen in the future, especially because there's so many other things that actually impact your blood sugar. It's not just food. It's adrenaline, it is excitement, it is stress, it is hormones that I have no control over, and you absolutely can't measure. So yes, with diabetes, there are some things that you can measure, and some things that you can deal with, but a lot of times you're playing catch up, you're playing a game of chase. And your only reward is that you get to start over again the next day and try again if you're lucky. And so that's why people with diabetes find it really hard to deal with. And that's why our blood sugar graphs often look like this. We're trying to stay between the target lines of where we want our blood sugar to be, but it's really, really hard. So this is about empathy and understanding. It's much harder than it looks like to deal with type 1 diabetes. Um, and I want you to understand that because that's the basis of what I'm going to talk about and the technological opportunities we have to help people with diabetes because it is so hard and so frustrating. And now people say, surely there's technology. There's something that can help, right? And there is. But it's like cruise control. And think about driving. With cruise control, you set your speed to, say, 70 miles per hour but you're still driving the car and you're still responsible for keeping yourself between the lanes, right? So it helps with one thing, but you've got to keep yourself between the lanes. And there is technology coming, 
that would be like the cruise control for diabetes. And that's the holy grail that is the artificial pancreas. Um, and I'll explain more details about what that is if you're not familiar. But the sad part is, it sounds really great. Yes, we know this technology, technology is possible, but it's not commercially available. And I will say, just for context, I submitted my slides a couple weeks ago, and you may have seen the news last week or this week that there's a new commercially approved artificial pancreas on the market. And what that means is one of the companies that has been developing a commercial artificial pancreas for years submitted to the FDA, and the FDA approved it much more quickly than they expected. So it's approved, but it's not on the market. It's not in the hands of people with diabetes, and it won't be for six more months. That's six more months of every day waking up and the first thing thinking about is, what happened last night? Am I gonna be okay today? And making 300 decisions throughout the day that impact your blood sugar. What you eat or don't eat. When you dose your insulin. When you test your blood sugar. Do you exercise or not? Are you hydrated? How much sleep did you get? What is stress is going on? Oh yeah, and potentially having a job, going to school, you know, living your life while living with diabetes. So, this stuff is not out there yet. And so life with diabetes, like I've said, is really, really frustrating. Because yes, we have tools and technology that help. There's something called an insulin pump that takes away the need for injections because you've got a small infusion uh, site infusing insulin under your skin. And that helps because then instead of doing injections several times a day, you have the insulin constantly going into your body. And if you need more insulin, you press a few buttons. But this technology is not perfect. And to go back to the car analogy, think about just having a gas pedal when driving. Now try to imagine keeping the same speed with no cruise control and just a gas pedal and no brake. You can step on the gas to speed up, you can step off the gas to speed down, but you're constantly going back and forth fluctuating and that's what it's like to have an insulin pump, is you can check your blood sugar, but all you have is the insulin pump to give yourself more or a little bit less insulin. And that's really, really hard. So an insulin pump is good, but that alone is not a cure. That is not good enough, and that's only one piece of the puzzle. Now there's other technology that will also help. There's something called a continuous glucose monitor that with a sensor that you can put into your body, it reads to a receiver, and it will tell your blood sugar every five minutes if you look at it. It's not like you've got some implant in your brain constantly feeding you what your blood sugar is. You have to pull this receiver out of your pocket, press the button, look at the screen, and that's a distraction from whatever it is that you're doing, right? So you can figure that out. But then, if you need to take action if something's going on with your blood sugar, either because you're rising or if you're dropping, guess what you have to do? You have to do a whole bunch of math, look at this other device, decide what to do, and do it. There's no automation, there's no interoperability between diabetes devices because these two things are made by different manufacturers. It's like dealing, getting a medical record between one EMR to another. You guys know how hard that is. Now imagine dealing with that frustration every moment of every day because data from one of your devices does not go to the other. And that's what it's like to be a patient in this modern world where we have some technology, but it's not interoperable. And so, that leaves people with diabetes to be frustrated. I'm gonna say this over and over again, just because I've lived with this for 14 years, I know the realities of this. And this screen, this graph, is a picture of my continuous glucose monitor. And just shows a sample day of how much my blood sugar goes up and how much it goes down. And you're, again, constantly playing uh, catch up and you're constantly ping-ponging back and forth while trying to do your job, live your life. It's hard, but paying attention to this is what keeps you alive but it's still not good enough. Because I said, you have to pull this thing out of your pocket and press the button, or wait till an alarm goes off. But these devices are dumb. The red and yellow lines you see there, you alarm when you pass one of those thresholds, but it's kind of too late. At that point, you're already high or already low. So maybe during the day, not such a big deal. You can take action, right? Oh, I'm high, I need more insulin, I press the buttons on my pump. To you, it may not seem like a big deal, but what's the one thing that every single person in this room has in common? What do we all do every night? We go to sleep. So imagine for the person with diabetes, if your blood sugar is doing this all night long, the only notification you get is if an alarm goes off that says you're low. And you have to wake yourself up from a sleep and go, something's going on, what woke me up? Is my alarm, is it time to get up? What's going, oh, I don't feel good. My blood sugar, oh gosh, I'm low, I need to drink a juice, I need to test my blood sugar, and all this at three o'clock in the morning. That's really hard, but that happens several times a week for a lot of people with diabetes. Except for me, because I am a champion sleeper. And I will not wake up for just about anything, uh, except for my alarm in the morning. And so I was really frustrated for years and years and years that I had this great device, 
but it wouldn't wake me up. And so I started to build up this fear of going to sleep at night. And imagine living by yourself across the country from your family and being afraid to go to sleep at night. It's not a good feeling. And people said, well, maybe you should get a roommate. And I'm like, really? Like, maybe I shouldn't have diabetes. Like, why is getting a roommate the first answer to this problem? And then people say, well, make the alarms louder. And I said, great idea. It's not possible. I cannot change this FDA-approved glorious medical device. And so I reached out to the manufacturers and said, can you make the alarms louder? And they say, oh, they're loud enough for most people. Well, that doesn't help me and my fear of going to sleep. And I said, can you make them louder? What can you do? Uh, I turned to the patient community. People had all kinds of great ideas that work for some people, like putting the device in a glass full of change so it'll rattle. I tried that, didn't work. So I would still sleep through my alarms. I was still really, really frustrated. And I thought, you know, my iPhone wakes me up in the morning. It makes these really loud, fabulous, annoying alarms. My computer makes loud, fabulous, annoying alarms. What if I could get the data off my device and onto some other device to make louder alarms? It sounds easy, right? But data access for people with medical devices is a huge problem. You've probably heard countless stories like that. But for the longest time, the FDA-approved medical software for this device in my pocket was for Windows. And I personally had a Mac. So I, as a patient, could not get my data off of my medical device until I borrowed somebody else's laptop, which meant maybe once a year I would look at my data, but this thing only stores 30 days of data. So I would have to borrow somebody's laptop once a month to get access to my retrospective data. Seems kind of silly, right? So this idea of just getting my data off was actually much, much harder than it sounded. And I thought, you know, I can't change the existing medical devices. Like, I can't do anything with this device in my pocket, but what if I added new tools? Is there some way for me to ultimately make these louder alarms? And the answer finally was yes. I had had this dream that if I could get the data off, I would put it on my iPhone, I would make all these loud alarms, I would send data to my family who lived across the country, it would be great, if only I could get the data. And even when I met my then boyfriend a couple years ago, he looked at my diabetes devices, started asking questions. Oh, but the data goes from one to the other, right? No, it doesn't work that way in medical devices. He comes from a technology engineering background, like medical device, let's go back 10 years, and that's the reality that we're in. And so finally, about six months after we started dating, I saw a tweet from Twitter, a post on Twitter, that got me really excited. It was from a dad who lived in New York State, and I was in Washington at this point, and he said, I found a way to get the data off my son's CGM while the dad was at work and his son was at preschool. And what the dad did was he reverse engineered that lovely Windows software that I couldn't access and managed to pull the data off in real time, upload it to a server, and then the dad was able to remotely review his kid's blood sugar. And I immediately texted my then boyfriend that says, look at this. I'm gonna reach out, we have to ask him if he'll share his code. I'm gonna steal your old Windows laptop because I need it. I'm gonna put it by my bedside and we're gonna make this work. And that's ultimately what we did. We took this code from this gentleman and this is my first exposure to the world of open source, which means code that is open and free for share and use for other people. And I was able to borrow my then boyfriend's laptop. I put it in my bedside table. I plugged in my continuous glucose monitor to it. We uploaded the data and every five minutes to Dropbox and then we sent it back to my phone. So we sent my data all around the world back to my phone and we were able to make the louder alarms. And that's all I wanted and it was fabulous. And all of a sudden I had these really loud alarms waking me up every night, which was great because that's what I was trying to do. But then I was like, you know, these alarms are kind of dumb. They're still dumb like the device in my pocket. If I take action after I've woken up, I should be able to snooze the system so it doesn't wake me up again in 15 minutes. So we added these snooze buttons so that if I woke up and took action, I would snooze the system. And we also added tiers of alarms so that if I woke up and took action, nobody else in my network would get woken up. But if I didn't wake up to that alarm as it was going off and off and on, because again, champion sleeper, then it would eventually alarm somebody else. And actually within the first two weeks of developing the system, I still slept through an alarm one night. My blood sugar was dropping very, very low. My boyfriend got the alarm and was able to call and wake me up and encourage me to drink a juice box. And so this system worked really, really well. But because I was starting to enter data, I was becoming a well-trained guinea pig in data entry. Now, I had previously never done any data entry before or data logging because it was pointless. You wrote it down on a piece of paper and it did nothing. But what this system taught me was it was giving me real-time feedback. If I put in data, it would snooze an alarm so I wouldn't be distracted later. 
And we ultimately built an algorithm that took the data and forecasted into the future what was going to happen. So it was no longer just, you're low, take action now, but it would start proactively giving me alarms saying, you're gonna be low in 60 minutes. You might wanna do something now. And then I had 60 minutes to decide when and what to do. So as I was working my job, because I'm a fully functioning adult with a day job, I was able to pause when it was convenient for me and not just by the time I was already low and definitely needed to drink a juice box or to eat something. And so this started to make a big, big difference for me, this proactive looking into the future, pulling all the data together. But again, this was a hack. This was me pulling data off of one device, entering it, using an algorithm that I built myself, but it was glorious. Um, the web interface was really, really basic. That's what's shown on screen. And you might be like, oh my gosh, that web interface is horrible. But I will tell you, we built this thing three years ago and I still use it today because it is so simple and it just works. And you can see it's telling me what my blood sugar is. It's giving me predictions. It's got the information about how much insulin and carbs I've been eating stored. And right there, it's saying no action required. But if my blood sugar was dropping or rising and I was going to go out of range, it would actually say, you need this much insulin. You need to eat carbohydrates. And it would send alarms to first my phone, but I also got a Pebble watch so I could display my data. So instead of having to pull out my phone, pull out my devices, I could just glance down at my watch and see what was happening. And the system was really fantastic, but we realized ultimately this is an open loop. I, as the human, was still making the decision and taking any action. So for a year, I used this open loop system, got really fantastic results. My average blood sugar dropped, the number of alarms I got dropped, I was getting more sleep, I was much happier, yay on all fronts. But within a year, we kind of started thinking, we have this really great algorithm, we have this fantastic set of tools, but I'm still kind of an open loop system, I'm still taking these actions. What happens if we closed the loop? What happens if we automatically communicated to my insulin pump about what needed to be happen? Is that even possible? And we actually found out that we have, we all have, the tools that we need to create an artificial pancreas. It's not rocket science. It takes your existing insulin pump, your existing continuous glucose monitor, and you add in a small smart computer, you add in a battery to power it, and a radio stick. And that will read data off the device and write to the insulin pump. And that's how I ended up with an artificial pancreas. And so for scale, um, you see the picture on screen, the Raspberry Pi battery and radio stick fit in this bag. This is an artificial pancreas, people. It's kind of awesome. Um, it does not fit in my pockets, I will say that, because I am a woman and women's fashion do not have giant pockets. It, it fits in most men's pockets. Um, so for the first year, I used this closed loop system. And I actually, we intended to only use it at night because that was my big problem, I was sleeping. But I loved it so much the f after the first night that I took it to work and I brought it home and I took it to work and I brought it home and I actually burned it out from running it so much the first couple days. So the only time I've been out without my closed loop has been the two days in that first week where I burned it out before I ordered replacement parts. And it's easy to order replacement parts because a Raspberry Pi is a small computer that you buy on Amazon. The battery you can buy at Amazon, at Walmart, at Target, wherever you go to get um, small computer parts or batteries. Like this stuff is really, really basic. But for context, over time, the innovation in this community has continued to happen. It's not just about the algorithm, but it's also the fact that we're able to use off-the-shelf hardware. Now, how many people remember or have been told about the rooms full of a computer? A big room and one computer. And now there are hundreds, if not thousands, of computers in this room because everybody's got at least one of them in their pocket. Yes, everybody's got a phone. You've got a small, smart computer. And for context, computing technology has gotten a lot smaller, even smaller than the phones in our pocket. There's a small computer chip called an Intel Edison that you stick on a board, you add a battery, and you've got a computer. And so my artificial pancreas over time has gone from this bag here to this device here. This is an Intel Edison, a small baseboard, a battery, and it's got a radio stick in it. And this is the artificial pancreas that communicates between my medical devices. This is all I needed to close the loop. It's pretty small. So what is life like with an artificial pancreas and why does it matter if you haven't gotten to the, to the realization that life with diabetes is frustrating and this is important? So I've shown you a bunch of different CGM graphs. If you look at the graphs on the top of the screen, 99% of them are between those lines and not just between the yellow and red line, but those lines are flat. That's three, six, 12, 24 hours where I hardly had to do anything beyond the basics with diabetes. Now we're talking about a hybrid closed loop. This means I still count my carbs, 
I still test my blood sugar, I calibrate my devices, and I'll do a meal bolus. I will sit down and give myself insulin for the meal. But after the meal, the loop will kick in and say, your blood sugar's rising, your blood sugar's dropping, you need to do something. But instead of me, the human, doing something, the system will automatically give me a little bit more or a little bit less insulin. And so I've now been looping for something like 670 plus days, and it is fantastic, and this is the future of where healthcare is going, where we take the math and the decision making out of the human's hand and put it in a computer. And I said before, it's not rocket science, it's really not. This is a sample of the code that says if your blood sugar is rising and you need more insulin, you get more insulin. If your blood sugar is dropping and you need less insulin than you normally get, you drop the insulin. Like it's the same math that I as a person with diabetes would do, turned into an algorithm which just basically means go through this decision tree that I would do in my head, but have the computer do it. But the beauty of the computer is that it doesn't sleep ever during the day or at night. And so every five minutes it will walk through this decision tree and say, I've got new data about what your blood sugar has been doing. I'm gonna make some projections about what will happen in the future. And if I need to take action, I will. And we designed the system to be safe. I, as the patient, absolutely care about safety. And so we designed it to only send small little increments of insulin adjusted above or below what I would normally be getting. And it's a 30 minute command, which means if something breaks or somebody steals my pancreas and walks away, I'm not out of luck. I just revert back to the normal operating procedures of my standalone insulin pump. So people ask about risk and Choosing this kind of technology is always going to be a personal risk evaluation, but I say living with diabetes, the day you're diagnosed, you're handed a vial of a lethal drug and sent home and said good luck. So having something that instead of me making math decisions at three o'clock in the morning is automatically making these really small adjustments as it needs, as a trend happens over time, that's way safer for me. And I absolutely agree and support using this technology and have continued to do. Now people say, well, what about regulations? Well. The FDA regulates commercial distribution and marketing of technology. I am doing this open source. I built the code myself. I have not given this device away from anybody else. But just to backtrack, when people get a new phone or you get a new medical device, you play around with it, you test it, right? You kick the tires, you wanna figure out how does it work? When does it work? When does it not? Where do you go where you get signal? Where do you go when you need to use Wi-Fi? What happens when you use this app combined with this app? What happens when you run out of memory? All that same kind of stuff is testing that people do with medical devices already. So the patient community is already self-regulating and making choices about the kind of technology they will and will not use. And it's important to note that I as an individual, or you as an individual, if you had diabetes or any other health condition, you absolutely have the right to do self-experimentation. So I'm an N of one experiment with this technology. I have the right to do so. And other people have the right to do so too. We're not handing anything away. We're not a business. We're not distributing. So this thing is not a medical device and it's not regulated by the FDA. And so this thing is fabulous and I said, I can't keep this to myself because there's nothing else out there like it and I want anybody else who wants to build their own to be able to do so themselves. And so we created what's called Open APS, which stands for the Open Source Artificial Pancreas Movement and this is about how do we make this code, this information, open source and available so that, that somebody wants to do it themselves they don't have to learn the hard lessons that we learned developing my system, but that, that knowledge is shared and that makes everybody safer. And the code itself is publicly online. If you're curious and checking it out, go to github.com slash openaps. The code is available there for you to look at. It's MIT licensed, so anybody can use it for any reason. Both commercial companies can use it, individual patients can use it if you want, and you can review the code and say, I have questions, or I think I found a bug, and if you find a bug, put in a pull request. That's what it's called when you put in a request to fix or change or update or alter the code in some way, and because we've had hundreds of people looking at this code, yeah, we found bugs, and we fixed them, and so this is ultimately safer than using a black box commercial system that's ultimately gonna come out on the market because we have the brightest minds in the community and the people who absolutely care and have tested it for all kinds of edge cases, constantly testing and looking at this stuff. And again, I wanna reiterate, this was designed for safety, to keep me safe at night. So this isn't something that I would put out there and say, like, don't use it, you know, like, look but don't touch. I say, think about it. This is not for everybody. You have to build it physically. You have to learn a little bit of coding to put the pieces together, but the algorithm itself is publicly available. It's open source. So if somebody says, you know, I need that for my son. I need that for myself to sleep, 
sleep safely at night. I don't want to wait. That's what the We Are Not Waiting and Open APS movement is all about, is about giving people the tools and the knowledge about how to DIY this safely and to say, you know, we're not waiting, we're gonna do this for ourselves. And so people always say, well, how many people are using this? Well, over time it's grown. Um, the slide from two weeks ago is now out of date. We have over 116 people around the world that we know of who have chosen to build some sort of DIY closed loop artificial pancreas. In context, there's millions of people in the US with type one diabetes. So small potatoes in terms of the number, but this represents something like 350,000 plus hours where maybe diabetes wasn't the only thing that person had to think about. That's a six, for every one person, that's likely four to five people who slept better at night because the system was running in their home. It's a kid who's able to go off to a sleepover and the parent doesn't have to go with them because the system will make any insulin adjustments instead of the parent having to go with it. Or the kid not having to leave class during school to go to the school nurse's office because the system is running in their classroom and helping keep them in range during the entire school day. So people say, well, should this be regulated, should it not? Again, there's the legal question of how the FDA could or could not regulate it because this is not a commercial thing. But I think it's important to note that even outside of diabetes, but especially with this project, over the years, people have been encouraged not to share code because code is a medical device. It's not. Um, but there's a lot of things that we need to figure out as a society as we have this technology available to us about what is a medical device or what is a medical system and what needs to be figured out. But unfortunately, people who do really amazing things that are not risky, that are actually like decreasing the risk of the community have been afraid to share their ideas, to share their code, and to be a part of this open source community because of the threat of being sued, of being regulated, of bad things happening. Because again, we're doing all this in our spare time, most of us. We have day jobs that are totally unrelated. You know, we do this nights and weekends because it's about us, it's about our families. And that's really, really frustrating for me to see. And I can say that because I personally, felt that chilling effect of regulation. I had conversations with the FDA when I built my first system, that open loop system, and we were very excited about it and said, this might help a lot of people. Like, it wakes you up at night if you're going low. This should be out in the hands of anybody who wants to build it. And we were encouraged not to share our code because code was foreseen as a medical device, even though it wasn't automated at all. Um, and that's really, really frustrating, and that's something that we as a society have to figure out. But I think the kind of key point for y'all to think about is, there are a lot of amazing ideas and innovations happening out in the general world, in the patient community, in the consumer world. There's a lot of things that are happening that are non-medical, non-health related, but that technology innovation, like the uh, miniaturization of computers, could really help us in healthcare. And we need to find more ways for industry, government, academia, and the general community to come together and share knowledge and share ideas and problem solve. And yes, we will have to deal with regulations, especially if there's a company, if we're dealing with um, marketing, distributing, all that kind of stuff. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't have more conversations and be sharing the innovations and sharing these conversations because it might help one person, it might help 30, 300, 3,000. We don't know until we start trying. And one of the things we are also advocating for as the patient community and have been talking to the FDA about this which is companies should not be held liable if they give us our data. Patients absolutely have a right to our data from our medical devices. And once that data is handed off to me in a safe way and the communication and the handoff process is clearly documented, that community, that company should no longer be at risk. If I as an individual go off and do something stupid, that's on me. I'm not gonna sue the company because I did something silly. And likewise, a third party app developer or somebody else goes off and builds an app or does something and something happens later down the line, that's not a reason not to allow access to, for patients to their data or to document the communication pro protocols and make them secure so that we can have interoperability of medical data and device data. This stuff is really, really important and that's the kind of stuff that we need to collectively figure out because we're not there yet. The devices are still separate, the data is not moving between them and there's still a lot of people who say, well, security, cyber, we can't let patients have their data and that's just wrong. So one of the last things I wanna say is point out how traditional innovation happens. People say, we have a problem. We need to go from point A to B. We need a car, or we need an artificial pancreas. And the development process right now in healthcare, somebody gets a wheel, you put the wheels together, you put the frame on, you're doing lots and lots of testing, and in five to 10 years, you end up with an automobile and you're able to drive. But that's 10 years without driving. That's a long time, right? Well, think about the we are not waiting 
the patient innovation, the user innovation movement, that we want to figure out how to bring that spirit into the rest of healthcare and what we're dealing with. What we say is we need to get from point A to point B. We'd like a fully automated artificial pancreas. We would like an automobile. But for the next couple of years, a scooter is better than walking. And then a, motor, a bike, and then a motorbike, and then a car. And that's really where we are in diabetes with artificial pancreas development. What's going to come out in the spring is the first of many artificial pancreases. It's not fully automated. The human still has to do a lot of work. It's what's called a hybrid closed loop but it's kind of closer to mine than anything else. And I have to say, after living with this for two years and knowing that there's only 100 people or so using this, people are going to love it because the cognitive burden of these types of diseases, the management, we were talking at the table um, before I came up on stage and trying to explain how many times a person thinks about diabetes. And on average, there's 300 things a day that you do that are impacting your blood sugar from what you eat and what you drink and when and how you dose your insulin. And then just even thinking and wondering, huh, what's my blood sugar doing while I'm on stage? What's my blood sugar to be doing in the next hour? Do I need to take action? All that stuff. There's this huge cognitive burden of living with diabetes. And this type of technology, even though yes, it's a baby step, but even a baby step is a huge improvement of the burden of living with these type of chronic diseases. And that's what we need to get to. We need to get to making these small steps forward of saying, we know our big moonshot dream is this thing, but we can make this small step and we can work together in new ways with new partners. They may not be traditional people inside of industry or academia or the government. They may not look like a traditional healthcare partner, but what happens if we partner with the patient community and we help 500 people in the next year? And that number grows and grows and grows over time. And we might come up with the next groundbreaking innovation that's going to totally change how we do healthcare or how we treat that chronic disease. And that's what we're hoping to see. So you'll hear us talk about we are not waiting. That's not just a diabetes hashtag. That's really about anybody in healthcare who says, we're not gonna wait for it to be better someday. We're gonna be part of the process and we're gonna start right now. We're gonna start small. We're gonna do anything we can because we have to change what we're doing now if we want to change the future of healthcare. And I encourage you and invite you to join me. Thank you. Thank you. Now I believe we have microphones. I don't know if there's any questions, um, but we have two microphones in the room. So if you'd raise your hand and we can bring a microphone to you. One on the right here. Oh, sure. Thank you, that was a great presentation. Uh, the question I have though is about taking the source code and you know, there are people that are wanting to make money off of things and uh, you seem to be keeping track of who's using the open source code and, and, um, and how they're uh, developing it. How, what would you, how would you feel if someone took that and you know, used it to try to make a profit off of it? That's a great question. And for background, the reason we're able to track is I have a form where people voluntarily say, hey, I'm done closing the loop. Um, and the reason we do that is because of the safety dialogue we've had with the FDA. They say, what if something goes wrong? How do you notify people? And we're like, well, we don't really. So let's create a mailing list. And that if people tell us that they're using the system, we'll put them on this Google group. And if there is something that we need to alert the community about, we will email them out. And so that's what I use to kind of track the number. But it's always why I say it's N equals one times 116 plus, because we don't truly know who's using it. Um, but to the answer to the other part of the question, which is what would you do? I would celebrate. We actually have had some medical device companies who have looked at our code, who have run tests of our code compared to their code, notably one company in Europe that's working on closed loop technology and has come away saying, yeah, we need to add some of these features in. There's no reason why we shouldn't. And the patient community obviously wants it. So that to us is a huge win. And there's a reason we use something called the MIT license, which encourages individuals or companies to use it. And all they have to do is give credit in their code somewhere. Um, and so they don't even necessarily have to tell us, although it'd be nice to say like, yeah, we took something from you. Um, we like, really like what you're doing, but we as a patient community will probably see in future generations some of the things that we as an open source community have worked on and these features that we've created coming out in those things. And whether it's they planned it all along or it came from our code and our community, it doesn't really matter. The whole point of this is I would love this to be in the hands of every single person who wants it. And if they don't have to DIY, great. But there's nothing yet, so DIY is an option. And in the future, if somebody could get a really good closed loop artificial pancreas without having to DIY, and it had all the features and tools that we needed, 
great. And there's probably a chance that I'll switch to want a commercial version in the future when it does all the bells and whistles I need to do based on my device. But that would be a huge win. And that's really what um, the We Are Not Waiting community has always been about. There's some people who choose to start an app company or start a company um, if they're innovating in the space. But I would say 75% of people don't. They like their day job or they don't want to do this full time. Um, but they just kind of commit themselves and their passion to putting this out there because unless you talk about the idea, unless it spreads, it's gonna go nowhere, it's gonna help no one. And that's really the difference in what's happening in today's world is this type of DIY hacking, this idea of an artificial pancreas, I wasn't the first one to do it, but I was one of the first ones to use social media to talk about it, to spread the idea and to encourage other people to connect. And the kind of the cascade of innovation has followed from that, but it's not rocket science, but it's using social media to connect people to share those ideas informally through the patient community. That's what's been able to make the difference now versus five or 10 years ago when somebody might have had the same idea. It was that open and transparent communication and that's equally as important as the code, the physical code itself being shared. Very altruistic. Yeah, very altruistic. Yeah, I mean, I don't make any money on this. Um, my now husband and I, we got married um, last year. We have spent probably, you know, thousands of hours between the two of us, not just building my own system, but working on documentation and answering questions to help other people get supporting up on it. And it's because doing something for someone else is just as important as doing something for you know, your own, and it's really empowering. It makes me feel so much better about managing my diabetes when I know that somebody else went to sleep that night feeling safe and not having the same fears that I know I used to have. That's a very big part of why people, we call it the pay it forward, and people often pay it forward. They share devices, they share code, they share knowledge, whatever it is, because they've been helped by people behind them. And we also talk about standing on the shoulders of giants. That's really what open source is, where somebody had one idea, somebody built on it, it got better and better and better and more useful. But there's a whole track record of tons of people who've contributed to this code, to this project. I just happen to be the one that tweets a lot and stands on stage a lot. Uh, but there's dozens of people that are part of this community that made this possible. Any other questions while we've got the microphone? And if not, um, I will be around the rest of the afternoon and look forward to discussing more offline. Thank you. Thank you.